I want to uh, shift a little bit and talk about the idea of kind of what's what's being done in terms of the ecosystem restoration camps movement, how that operates a little bit. And it brought to mind again when I watched uh, Green Gold the other night in preparation for this. And you reflected that the what eventually convinced the people of the Los Plateau to participate was that they would have tenure on the land and that they would directly benefit from the effort in the new project and that convinced them to keep their livestock penned in and not let them graze the new plantings. A lot of the work um, that restoration camps are doing in the U.S. is it's on private land. It's kind of always under the threat of being sold. So in this financialized economy, land can be incredibly valuable, especially land that has been restored to a greater level of functioning. So I'm curious what you think about how we can ensure that people who are interested in participating in this work can have land tenure, can directly benefit from the participation, not just in the establishment phase, but in the more mature phase of the functioning ecosystem. And how do we make sure that we're not just improving the land of already wealthy government agencies sure. or people? Yeah, I think <clears throat> really the, the way to look at that from a political analysis, I suppose, is that you're afraid to see the emergence of a sort of neo-feudalism. Mm. And that's, uh, that's, but th I mean, that's basically already here because the, the situation now with the billionaires, we, we create, we're creating billionaires, a billionaire class, and we're creating billions of people who are destitute. So this isn't working at all. I, I've never seen anybody increase soil fertility or infiltration and retention of moisture if they're walking around wearing cufflinks and, and you know, thousand dollar suits and stuff. That's not going to happen. They could write a check or they could sign a policy decision or something if they have that kind of authority. But <clears throat> the real heroes in this are the people who do the work. And they are usually not even con compensated, so it's ridiculous. So in, in order to look at that, you get into more kinds of complexity. So you have ser different types of issues. You have hydrology, soil fertility, biodiversity, botany, horticulture, that sort of thing, genetic, uh, sort of the, the <clears throat> maintaining the, the the diversity in in the in the systems is is very very important at this time. So that has to happen, no matter what the political system is. So the political system actually has to has to be secondary. It's, I we were talking earlier about primary systems and secondary systems, and so. A lot of people are trying, well, let's work on the secondary systems. Let's go and, you know, let's talk about what we're going to do with this and that. Well, how long does that take? You know, so like I, I've been observing the climate change discussions. You know, we're into decades of discussions. And basically, it's pointless unless we understand what it is. And we still aren't there. So like talking about carbon disequilibrium in the atmosphere, or carbon markets and carbon, you know, that is not where it's at. And the people who have been doing that have been trying to control flows of money. So they've made an a observation about, well, I mean, it was in 1997 when they first made the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, they, ca they called it the Clean Development Mechanism. And so all this public money was distributed back to the same industries that had created the problem in order to give them new equipment that was less polluting, less, had less emissions, or was more energy efficient, or was converting from polluting energy sources to renewable energies. Well, that's kind of interesting, but it, it, it actually is, is rewarding those people who created the problem. And it has no possibility 
of completely addressing climate change. It can only be less bad than the earlier things that those same people did. So you're buying into the same system again for more decades, which and what has happened? More climate change, more emissions, no change, no serious change, but billions and trillions going back into that system. To understand that, you have to see the difference between biotic systems and abiotic systems. So when we're talking about energy or governance or, or communications or education or transportation or energy or any of that stuff, it's abiotic systems. It's infrastructural. And if you're playing in the secondary systems. So you haven't yet got to the actual problem. Mm -hmm. And so the problem of climate change is that human beings are influencing the systems that determined the evolutionary succession of life on the planet. And the systems that emerged from the principles, so we're altering, we're, we're not understanding the principles, and we're altering the systems because we're degrading the, the things which we're creating, constantly filtering, and continuously renewing the life support systems on the earth. And so I, I don't think there are very many people on the planet yet who can say that in a sentence because they keep talking about the energy systems or the, the transportation systems or the governance systems. Well, you can do anything you want in that, but if you don't understand what the fundamental problem is, you have no in impact mm -hmm. exactly on the, I mean, or, or your impact is minimal because you haven't really talked about the fundamental systemic problems. Mm -hmm. This has been something that I've been noticing for a very long time and I've been trying to tell the world about, but you know, it's, it's, it's also come to my attention that maybe you can't teach anybody anything. Hmm. You, can only, you can only make it possible for them to learn. Yeah, I th and I think that could be the place, that notion of an invitation or making, creating the conditions, it is th there's still this interplay between the secondary and the primary system. So for instance, the UN declared the, uh, the decade on ecosystem restoration. So a secondary system uh, trying to support the uh, you know, investment, the work, the public consciousness around primary systems, yes. right? It's an and acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement. And um, I guess it brings to mind for me, like if, if the functions of these secondary systems role in this might be to unlock means of access, means of, of funding, uh, because we still are operating in a monetary economy and people still are relying on getting their basic needs met through that. I think it's, it's on the minds and hearts of a lot of young people who look at this work, who acknowledge its importance and try to find a way that their life can be a part of that mm -hmm. if they're living paycheck to paycheck or if they are, are you know, otherwise just struggling to survive. And it strikes me that you know, m it might be necessary that there be a considerable transfer of land holding and of wealth that is required in, in order for this to really happen and take hold, in order for people to want to participate without feeling like they're playing into this, the conditions of neo-feudalism as we referred to. Yeah, exactly. But I think you, you've, you've come close now to what has to happen. Like if, if we consider money, mm -hmm. the real question there is, what is money? That is uh, defined in a few ways. So money is a storehouse of value. It's a means of exchange. And it's a trust mechanism. So 
it's a basically it's a belief system it's it's whatever we want it to be so if a critical mass of human civilization were to understand that ecological function was the basis of real value of, of life on earth then they will trust in economy and currency which incentivizes conservation protection of nature and the restoration of all degraded lands on the earth that's the only possible way forward and and that's not a own that's it's about sustainability but it, more more importantly it's about survival so if we intend to survive, that's what we have to do. And it incentivizes all the people to work for ecological function and in doing that to be rewarded with abundance. So this is a completely different perspective. And we can see it in certain places, but the complexities are enormous. It, you know, your acknowledgement at the very beginning is correct. It's not only human beings, it's all life forms. And, and all of those life forms are in symbiotic relationship with each other. That's the only way we live. So to, to pretend that, you know, making a movie or making a, uh, something and generating income and you know having bigger and bigger houses and bigger and bigger cars is anything is 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 ridiculous because ultimately we die and then our bodies become part of the necromass that's recycling as each generation of life dies and gives up its body to nurture the next. And we're just one of many generations of life that has come before us. Mm -hmm. And we're determining whether future generations can continue. And especially, it's not really life or the earth that's endangered. It's really just human civilization. So one of the things that comes to mind in this is what you were talking about, about land tenure and sovereignty. There's no way, you know, the native indigenous people were unable to grasp the idea of ownership of land. That's ridiculous to them. And they're right. It's ridiculous to them because it's a, it's a corrupt concept from its very beginning. And so, you know, to hold on to a corrupt concept is basically to lose your soul. It, we need to come up, and it's not up to an individual to decide what's going to happen, but there are certain things that have looked pretty promising. The community land trust ideas. We can see this happening now with homeless people. So if community land trusts or community trusts, property trusts, emerge, then it's possible to aggregate wealth, even with fiat currencies. Mm -hmm. But if you have another currency, which is based on ecological function, and that starts to accrue, that's actually going to incentivize much more uh, improvement, because you're going to be incentivizing restoration instead of degradation. Now you help people get housed, but you don't have singular problems. There is, there is no singularity there. They're all interrelated. So if they have to go to work in order to make money, in order to pay for their housing, in order to pay for their food, but their work is in industries which are destructive mm -hmm. instead of regenerative. So if we incentivize regeneration, then their work, all of our work, goes to restoring the earth. Now, if that's the case, then we, there's no possibility to stop hum, human civilization. We're so clever, we're so capable that we can restore all the earth easily if, if we get 
if that's the central intention of human civilization, then we will do it. Thank mm -hmm. you.